Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is Sunday, February 14th of 2021. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. The article that I'm going to be using as a reference to today's podcast was published just a couple days ago on the 28th of January in the Journal of Critical Care Medicine. Definitely recommend that you read it for yourself. It's free for you to download. It's down in the show notes. It's on my website, eddiejoemd.com. And again, it's free for everybody to get. And it's a very valuable part of practicing critical care, which is the reason why I decided to share with this, share this with you all here today. Part of the reason why I love critical care, and as do those of you who follow me on this medium and also practice critical care, no matter what part of it you are, whether you're a physician, NP, PA, respiratory therapist, nurse, CNA, etc., is that we honestly love the sexy high adrenaline stuff that we do to keep people alive. Some of the not so sexy stuff that we do honestly includes trying to save money as well as resources to provide a good value for our hospital system as well as the country as a whole if we're being honest because a lot of these patients don't have a payer source. Money has to come out of somewhere. A lot of these patients have Medicare and Medicaid, which is ultimately our tax dollars. So it's our responsibility to be very, very wise and cognizant of the costs of the care that we're providing. Now, the first Choosing Wisely initiatives was a list of five recommendations, which included the opinions of many people in critical care. They took the opinions of the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, the American College of Chest Physicians, the American Thoracic Society, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And this was published in 2014. Given that today, again, is February of 2021, these first five recommendations that they put out in 2014 have been deeply ingrained into our minds. We adhere to these recommendations because many of us were trained with these recommendations in mind. Links to the first set of recommendations are on the website, but basically they include, and again, this is in my own words, first, a recommendation to not order diagnostic tests daily. And this means like just order daily CBCs, daily BMPs, things like that. And what they want you to do, and I completely agree with this, is to only order tests to figure out certain clinical questions. And it it seems like it's uh, they were taking a dig at people who get daily chest x-rays, daily blood gases, and things like that. To some degree, I'm guilty for some of these things because I like to, uh, you know, usually after the first day of resuscitation, I am aggressively de-resuscitating people. And so I am a fan of making sure I don't destroy people's kidneys in the processes of doing this. And in addition to that, I like to check their magnesium and phosphorus levels because I'm very cognizant of their electrolytes to help me have more successful intubations, excuse me, extubations. The second recommendation that they had at that time was to avoid transfusing patients with PRBCs if they were hemodynamically stable, as well as non-bleeding if their hemoglobin was greater than seven. It seems as if some clinicians haven't gotten this memo, but here we are. Obviously, there are different cases and every patient is uh, a little bit different. But again, don't routinely transfuse people if their hemoglobin is greater than seven. The third recommendation, and I've talked about this ad nauseum during my nutrition posts, is to not give patients parental nutrition within the first seven days of them being in the intensive care unit if they were appropriately nourished prior to hospitalization. Again, if somebody was malnourished before, there's data to suggest you could start it earlier. But if somebody was nice, robust, and you're unable to give them enteral nutrition, you could wait a week before giving them parental nutrition. Their fourth recommendation from the 2014 guidelines was to not snow your patients. <laughs> and by snow, I mean over sedate them. Those of you who are listening to this know what snowing your patients means. But you should have an indication if you are going to snow your patient. <laughs> and again, I don't, don't get mad at me because I use that term. We all use that term. But if you're going to snow your patient, you have to have an indication to do so. And you should go ahead and make attempts every single day for spontaneous awakening trials and lighten the sedation daily to see what the patients are doing underneath. Moving on now to the fifth recommendation. They also want you and me, all of us in critical care, to take the time to talk to patients and families about comfort measures if it is appropriate. We all know that we get patients who come in through the ED from an outside hospital or from the floor in whom aggressive measures, despite everything we do, are only going to lead to further pain, discomfort, and by no means whatsoever are they going to improve the patient's mortality nor their quality of life. 
And so it is our responsibility to at least offer to certain families the opportunity for them to go towards you know, comfort measures. And of course, when I say families, I also mean the patients because you need to let the patients know what's going on. You can't blindside them with it. And it's very hard to do sometimes, but it's, it's part of our job. I have to say I'm quite the fan of these five measures. And I think that the authors for the first uh, 2014 recommendations did a fantastic job. Now for 20, 2021, there are five new recommendations for choosing wisely in critical care that we're going to go over now. The first recommendation is a reminder that we should not keep in uh, central lines, Foley catheters, as well as drains without a clear indication. The reason for this is that all of these lead to hospital acquired infections as well as unintended safety events. The sooner you can get them out, the better. Here, the authors clearly have a point, but sometimes I must admit, I must be honest, that I struggle with getting rid of central lines as well as arterial lines in some patients who are quite marginal. I guess I could defend the fact that they're marginal and therefore I have an indication to keep them in, but I know that this is something that hospital administrators are watching closely since we don't get reimbursed for hospital-acquired infections from central lines as well as, um, as, well as urinary catheters, but, you know, it's, it's just the way that things are going right now. I, I know I get asked free, frequently by our fantastic nursing staff if the central line and Foley catheter could go. I personally like the Foley catheter sometimes because, especially in the de-resuscitation phase that I mentioned earlier, because I usually aggressively diurese these patients and I really want to know what their kidneys are doing and how much urine output they're making. I know, I know that you can, you know, get a condom cath or, uh, or pure wick or whatever the, what is, what is it? I'm not even going to say on the podcast what some of the names are for this, uh, like the cooter canoe. Anyway, I did say it. I did it. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, that's all. Those are all fine and dandy, but sometimes I want something more exact. It's just the obsessive critical care nature of myself. The second recommendation that they made in the 2021 guidelines is to extubate patients as soon as possible. The, they obviously have a more eloquent way of saying this by stating, and I quote, don't delay liberation from mechanical ventilation, end quote. This is where the spontaneous breathing trials, which we commonly call SBTs, as well as the spontaneous awakening trials are so valuable. And I greatly appreciate the respiratory therapists as well as the nursing staff who work together to line these two things up to help these things take place and therefore help us liberate patients from mechanical ventilation sooner. I know that I've taken care of people before where consultants say, hey, I want to do this procedure three days from now. Don't extubate the patient. And uh, here I just scratch my head and I say, okay, well, I'm not going to listen to you. Sorry. I don't want to keep the patient tube for a couple more days. The third recommendation is something I should have a discussion with some of my infectious disease colleagues um, because it states that we should not continue antibiotic therapy without evidence of a need for this. This one's kind of hard because at the, in the back of our minds, we have this fear of litigation by either not starting an antibiotic or by discontinuing an antibiotic perhaps early. But we have the responsibility of being great stewards of antibiotics, and that's kind of our job. Sometimes certain clinicians obsess, so to speak, about these small fluctuations and why blood cell counts. <laughs> and so this, this might make it a little bit more difficult to discontinue antibiotics or at least justify that they're keeping them on. But again, I ultimately agree that we should be stopping more antibiotics. I know I've said this a bunch of times already, but I'm also a big fan of number four, which states that we should not delay mobilizing our patients. And Obviously, we know that our patients, while they're critically ill, could develop weakness as well as atrophy of their muscles. Here, something that I found to be quite helpful is a very good relationship with our physical therapists as well as our occupational therapists who could together help mobilize our patients a little bit easier and therefore mitigate this to some degree. I, I'm a fan of walking patients who are on mechanical ventilation when it's appropriate. So I'm happy to see this make the I'm happy to see this make the list, and I think that we should be doing this a little bit more often. The last recommendation states that we should not, quote, provide care that is discordant with the patient's goals and values, end quote. 
In my personal practice, I try to discuss goals of care with all my patients and their families amongst arrival to the intensive care unit. These types of discussions, as justified by the authors, help decrease ICU admissions and overall hospitalizations near the end of life. Although I must admit that once they're in the ICU, it's really hard for families to change their mind. This is something that could be more appropriately addressed in the outpatient setting with either the patient's primary care physician or other physicians who take care of the patient. For example, I work in a group that has an outpatient pulmonary office, and I know that my partners who are pulmonary critical care, they, take, they, they approach these measures pretty aggressively with their patients who have COPD and are currently on the decline clinically. All in all, I strongly agree with the recommendations made by this group, and I think they did a fantastic job. The reason why I'm sharing this with you all today is to help spread the word of these practices that we should be taking into our practice in our respective intensive care units. The other thing is that it seems as if some of these, um, some of these concepts could be new to certain hospitals and certain intensive care units. And I know that a lot of people who listen to my content go back and they give their, you know, colleagues or they give the doctors, if they're nurses or respiratory therapists, some of the articles and commentary that I make on them for them to read and hopefully change their practice. So if this helps spread the word a little bit as to these, these great recommendations and overall it could help out, help us out as a country and as a entire world in critical care, I think that's quite beneficial. So therefore, if, if somebody spreads this around, it'll be well worth my efforts. Thank you so much, guys, for listening to my podcast. I greatly appreciate your support. Hope you all have a great day. Bye.